the things I believe most is that we all had childhood dreams and your senior years are the best time to make sure you get to try all those dreams out. I'm Pat Hyde. I'm 85 years young and I've been a teacher and a principal of schools. I've taught everything from first all the way up through college really uh, in workshops. I've published a book. So I've had a good life. Some of the misconceptions are as we grow older that we're not as active. We're not as involved in life. And I think a very important thing in old age is that we keep our mind and our bodies active. People do not look ahead and think that each day is an important day for living and they begin to develop a negative attitude. So very important to have a positive attitude in aging and think of all the things that you can accomplish. Uh, well, I've had, I've had both. I've had very happy life, very happy things that happened to me. One of the radio stations I worked for sent my picture in to a national magazine and people had a vote on the work that you had done and I ended up winning that and that was pretty wonderful. And when I was dating my first husband, I took him to the magazine stand and opened it up and I said, okay, this is what you're getting. <laughs> this wonderful woman. And the saddest moment in my life was losing my daughter at uh, the age of 37. And it was tragic. It was tragic. Because she was, she was such an incredible creature. She was creative, she was talented, she was kind. And we're all missing her. The misconceptions about old age are that you've got to take it easy and stop doing all the things you've been doing. When in reality, it's the best time of your life if you just approach it the right way. Through activities, exercise, and doing things you always wanted to do, and this is the time to do them. You answer to no one except yourself. And as I said, you can think of it as kind of the world of your own, or the world where you don't have to report to anybody. In old age, you either lose your physical facilities or your mental facilities. I'm not sure which is better or worse, but I've retained my mental facilities, but uh, my physical facilities are somewhat uh, halting. I uh, have a little problem balancing, so I use a cane which is relatively new this year. Uh, 104 has not been a great year. 103 was much better. I'm looking to 105. Well, from my point of view, it's, it's a lot of attitude. A lot of people, if they think themselves old, they seem to get older faster, you know? I have a, a real problem in the sense that I, I must be unrealistic, but I don't think of myself as being old at all in terms of what I can do and can't do. Well, the, the most discouraging thing about being over 80 is the things that you can no longer do. I have ridden a bicycle across Europe and over the Grand Corniche and also in England can't do that anymore. I was a very good middle distance runner in high school. Now I can't even run. <laughs> All due to my uh, aging back. So that makes it very important to have something like this that I can keep doing as long as I'm basically healthy enough to climb into it. My biggest pet peeve about that is when the people I work with, the people I know, get told, well, you're just getting older. You can't do that anymore because you're just getting older. Uh, 
common one, you're not gonna be able to play tennis anymore. It's just because you're getting older. And I look at them and say, well, why can't you play tennis anymore? What is it that's taking you out of the game? What is it about your body that means you can't play? How about we work on changing that? Because the truth is that the body is adapting until the day we pass. It has a reduced ability to adapt the older we get, but it can still adapt. We're always turning over cells. We're always uh, adapting to the way we move and, and what we do in our movement uh, and how we support that with rest and nutrition. Um, so why don't we look instead of, uh, you know, use the scapegoat of, well, you're just getting older. Let's address the actual things, the specific things that are taking us out of the things we like to do. Well, some of the misconceptions of aging is that they thought, well, I'm not going to live too long because my father or mother died at 70 or 75, and I don't think it's, I'm going to do any better. And so they think there's no, no use. I'll play golf. Uh, I'll take a vacation. I don't need to exercise. I don't care what I eat or drink, and I'll just let it take its course. As we used to say, in, in your 50s are your last best chance to build the body that's going to carry you through your senior years. And I say that now, I say, look, your 50s and 60s are your last best chance, because I work with a lot of people in their 60s and even in their 70s who are changing their body, that are making it more resilient, more capable of being independent, mobile, into their senior years and through their senior years. Uh, maintaining that mobility is really important because what takes a lot of people out of their own home, of their own apartment, and needing assistance dealing with um, just basic everyday needs is the loss of mobility. As you get older, uh, exercise is very important, and it comes down to a very simple finding by no one less than the Mayo Clinic. Roughly three hours a week. The ideal thing to remember is if you can walk two and three quarter miles, and do it in about an hour, maybe a little more, a little less. Do that three times a week. That is basic for everybody as they approach their senior years. Then in addition to that, if you can do it a few more times a week, that's icing on the cake. And then ideally, I know it sounds kind of crazy, but if you buy a set of one pound weights and just simply take those weights, and when you're walking, you know, you. Raise your arm, one, two, three, four, with the one pound weight, two pound weight if you feel like it. You really don't need to do much more than that. Just keep that up and you're on your way. And it's good to do yoga, but that's another thing entirely. I exercise all the time and have throughout my life. I've played all sports and I've traveled and hiked the different areas. Uh, today I exercise by walking several miles a day. That's about all I do as far as exercise and I keep busy. I exercise 25 minutes a day at least, or swim. My diet is very simple. I eat green salads every day. I don't indulge in alcohol. I have never uh, drank very much, even in my younger years and I don't smoke. As to the ideal diet, I would say for someone say over 80, first and foremost, and this is what gets missed a lot, is are they even breaking their food down? Are they breaking their supplements down? Are they breaking their food down? What happens really after the age of 50 is there's a significant progressive decrease in hydrochloric acid. So what happens there is that disables your ability to even break food down. So first step is, is to make sure that you're breaking food down. A simple way to help you break food down is to have like a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar about 15 minutes before you eat in about a third cup of room temperature water. It helps to stimulate the gastric juices in the stomach to then help the body more adequately break proteins, fats, and carbohydrates down. What's happening a lot with elders is that they're fermenting food in their stomach because they don't have the adequate hydrochloric acid to even break it down. So that's the preliminary point before we even get to what should someone be eating. Can you even break down what you're eating? So the next step is, okay, say you're breaking it down. Now what do you eat? You want to eat as close to nature as possible, real foods. 
Watch your sugars. Ideally, what I found to be really successful for seniors is clean, lean protein. Okay, clean, lean protein like chicken, fish, lamb, grass-fed beef, turkey, and then really nutrient-dense veggies, keeping it all organic. Why organic? Why is that so important? Because non-organic produce is sprayed with toxic chemicals. Those toxic chemicals get into someone's body, and especially if you're an elder, they cause oxidative stress and they push that aging process even faster. As I said, I'm 82 years old and I pretty much still eat the same things I've been eating all my life. I really have not gotten into the health food kicks. Um, <laughs> I eat lots of popcorn. Um, you know, uh, I eat vegetables and meat and fruit, basic things, but um, I just eat the way I've been eating for 82 years. I'm a nutritionist and my diet has always been very important to me. Uh, I try to eat a diet that's skewed in the direction of vegetarianism, but I every once in a while I like to have a nice barbecued steak and things like that. I'll even occasionally have a hot dog, but in general I skew more toward vegetarianism and I have a tendency to try to eat fish several times a week. I figure at 91, if I want sweets, I'm going to have them. I'm going to eat what I want to eat. I figure I don't have a lot of years to do this, and I'm going to make them as delicious and as wonderful as possible. So I, I think the key is to live as close to nature as possible. And I think that's what everything's kind of showing us. We're getting sicker and sicker, and it's because our environment is sick, too. We have too many environmental toxins, and that's all affecting us. So I think, you know, eat mostly plants. Um, slow down. Don't be on electronics late at night, because we are in tune with the light and dark cycles, so the sun and the moon, right? So we're not meant to stay up way into the night. The closer we are to the light-dark cycles, the closer we are to eating whole, natural, unprocessed food, the healthier we're going to be. Um, not getting so caught up in the busyness of life and taking more time to connect with others and to just slow down and be and not get so distracted because once we start getting distracted our body is sent into a stress response and that stress response is a breakdown mode and most of us live our, our life in that mode chronically over time and what that does is it's not going to kill you right it's not going to kill you right away but it's going to diminish the quality of your life right and these symptoms that appear like inability to lose weight, you're tired all the time, you have brain fog, your memory's not as good as it used to be, you can't concentrate well, you're, you know, maybe your balance is off a little bit. All these things really can be reversible. If you have joint pain, it's really reversible, but you have to just provide the right conditions and find the right people who can educate you on how you can do that. What I say is that we're meant to belong. Human beings are born into family, we thrive in community, we suffer in isolation, that's how we punish people. Um, it's part of what we are as human beings. We need to belong to a group, we need to have a purpose in our life, and so I think it's really critical uh, that as we age that we maintain those interactions. Especially giving, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, people tend to be in their 80s and over, and the reality is that we're losing people to death, to passing, which is natural and normal. And I can't think of a more important reason to maintain those, given that you're going to be losing people as the natural process of life. And so the connections you do have are that much more important because you're going to have fewer and fewer of them if you're not making new connections. Oh, I have uh, three friends who are almost my age that I've been friendly with for 65 years. So. People invite us to play bridge and go out to dinner and all, and they're in their 70s and a couple 80s, and we're the old folks. <laughs> but they tell us to keep rocking. <laughs> yes, my social life? Well, three times a week I play bridge, if you know what that means. 
and you're with these people. Well, I met them nine years ago, and I'm still with them. <laughs> Some of them died. <laughs> and social life, I have three daughters, and they keep me pretty busy with their social life and coming to their parties. And so I am more active than I would like to be, but I take time to write poetry. <laughs> I don't think that we're solitary creatures. And in fact, there's been studies on this. The longest study ever on human happiness was done at Harvard. And since 1938, they took over 700 men and they studied them like week in, week out, right? They were interviewing them weekly um, for this many years. And it had maybe four directors that had, um, had directed this research because you, you know, normally they don't get this long of research because in any one particular study, because you have you know, people dying and moving on to different careers and things like that. But they took these men up until their 80s, so from 1938 into their 80s, and what they found was the single best predictor of whether they had health at 80 was if they were in a healthy relationship at 50. Friends are crucial to older living. Uh, you need someone to talk to, to share, to have fun with. My 91-year-old friend is over here and we play golf together. And we've come in first and we've come in second and we've come in sixth, but we have so much fun playing golf. And I played, we played with a hundred year old as well as young people, much younger. So, uh, but mostly for a support system, you need to be able to have someone you can trust, somebody you can talk to, somebody that uh, you know will be there for your back. It is so huge to, to have that social interaction. And I have a, a good example of a, you know, a sister who, sadly enough, she, she passed away from cancer. And she lives in Michigan. And when I would call, you know, she would hardly even talk until she got that phone call from me. And just that, that interaction from her sister really gave us hope that she was going to be okay. And this is somebody that was on her deathbed that was slurring her words, but my mom would put her on the phone with me, and there was such clarity in her voice because she, she's hearing from, from her sister. So it is, it is a huge, huge factor. I see a lot of patients that are by themselves that go into depression. Um, because they're not being visited. And just a little, little bit of a visit and a smile from someone makes a big difference. So I have very close friends and uh, I belong to several organizations, a luncheon group, which is a fun group, a classical reading group, which is a little more serious, and a special group of six or seven people who are all very highly educated, PhDs and so forth, who each give a lecture every two weeks on their specialty, uh, whether it be atomic energy, whether it be poetry, which is my specialty, or whether it, it be uh, law or the legal situation, which, but each one has a specialty and, and usually uh, spends time in that field. I don't think you should fear old age. I think you should engage in, in everything that's offered at old age and look at each day as a new day, as an exciting, important day that something new is going to happen, you're going to meet someone new. Something else that I really believe in, I try to do a kind act or go out of my way for someone uh, every day, whether it's making a, a phone call to someone I went last night until 10.30 to see a friend who lost her sister who was crying on the phone. And as we get older, that's part of our support system. We need to be there. She has no more family. Her sister died. We need to be there for one another. You need to understand that whatever is causing you any kind of anxiety in this world, and depression in this world, you have to understand that the root is fear. The root cause is fear. And human beings suffer from all kinds of different fears. But the key thing to a healthy 
life is to be able to, through whatever methods that you have, meditation is primary, do some meditation, uncover the fears that you know that you're feeling, write them down, make them physical. Because one thing I know is true is anxiety is physical. You have a, a it's a feeling where people have anxiety, stress, they say that they're feeling like they're having a heart attack. That's like a sensation, a physical sensation that your heart is breaking. When you have that feeling, know that you're suffering from some level of fear. And then you know now, see that's the beauty of it. It's the physical sensation of anxiety that tells you that you're suffering from fear. So now you need to go discover what is that fear. And then you need to bring it into life so that you can extinguish it. All right, so I help people with the grief process because there are some slippery stages in grief and it is so helpful to know how to navigate that. So I create a very safe container for people so they don't try to sidestep it and they can dive in and feel safe and supported. So the stages of grief, the first one is shock and disbelief. And it can just be for a moment, we're shocked and we can't believe we almost had an accident or whatever. And then people that do have like a major loss, I've worked with so many clients that lost their spouse, they lost their mate, that they were together 50 years and that's just absolutely traumatic. And so they have the shock and the disbelief and then they move to sadness, deep sadness, anger and sometimes those go back and forth and all the way it, it's not a straight shot unfortunately and then what i notice in my client base is so many people get stuck in the bargaining stage of the grief process that's where they're saying if only if only he hadn't gone out that night by himself and had that accident or if only i hadn't fallen in the parking lot you know when it wasn't lit well if only if only that keeps them stuck so I help them move forward to get to the acceptance so they can let things go, get the lessons out of it and the learning and move forward and start letting in. That's where the excitement comes. If someone is depressed, they're gonna decline. They're absolutely gonna decline. Their stress level is gonna be higher, their cortisol is gonna be higher, and that is a premature aging hormone. And if they can maintain activity and social connection and happiness in what they do, it's a world of difference for them because the alternative is a high stress state and isolation and that's where they just begin to deteriorate even quicker. My daughter got me into this. My daughter had a stroke at age 31 and she is paralyzed on her left side and the prognosis was not good. They wanted us to either put our grandsons into foster care or uh, put our daughter into some kind of a convalescent home and we refused. So my husband and I just, we bit the bullet and we took care of our daughter. and. Today, my daughter works. She has a job at DBC. She progressed beyond what they uh, said that she would, and we raised our three grandsons, and they are the joy of our life. Well, I almost died about 13 or 14 times. Uh, when I was in high school, I got a, two serious brain concussions, I was unconscious for two weeks. I was run over by a truck loaded with peaches, about two tons. Uh, we, later I was in the Marine Corps and got myself stupidly isolated in a landmine field. And then after that I was in an accident where my friend rolled his pickup and we flew into a canal, sank to the bottom, and then had it to kick our way out of it. Then I was uh, fell off a two-story building. And then in addition to that, most recently was, was uh, an airplane crash about seven years ago. That, and we lost an engine, turned the plane upside down in a marsh and, and had to get out of that. So in addition to that, I, I was a twin actually. And I didn't know this until much later, but the other twin died in the uterus. And usually both twins die, so I'm lucky to be here. So, and then I got an infection 
a general bone infection in the fifth grade and, and I was one of the first in 46 to have penicillin. It basically saved my life. So, and there are other little stories. I've lived through many wars and many depressions and economic rises and failures. And the main thing at 104, you still have to have hope that things will be better or change. Oh, I think life has a way of sneaking up on you. I'm, I'm going through a little of that now. I have a little back problem. But I say, Connie, it's a little back problem. Look around at people who are on walkers and crutches. You have a little back problem. <laughs> Take an aspirin and get out there and play. And my friends all say, you're going to bocce and you're going to bowl and you're going to golf with your bad back. I said, what bad back? <laughs> Aspirin takes care of it. I remember a quote, and I've lived by it, is that life's too serious to be serious about it. So, um, so I grew up in Hartford, Connecticut, and um, Mark Twain is kind of my homeboy because the Mark Twain house is on Farmington Avenue in Hartford. And, um, you know, he's famous for a phrase, uh, a quote that says, you know, Age is just an issue of mind over matter. And if you don't mind, it doesn't matter. Well, even though he's my homeboy, I'm sorry, Mark Twain, I totally disagree, all right? Because it must matter to you, okay? And you need to mind your business of growing older. Because if you don't, who else will? As we grow older, sometimes the cost of healthcare expenses increase dramatically whether that means in-home care or medicines or really being able to afford the care you need and utilizing the reverse mortgage to access some of the equity that they've saved over the years can really make a huge difference in the quality of their life. I think the key to a happy life is realizing who you are and what I mean by that is and this is why you're seeing meditation everywhere these days, is because what meditation does is it really shows you who you really are. So there's an illusion that our awareness or our consciousness tends to identify with our thoughts, right? So we have a thought, I'm angry, and we automatically think, I'm angry. But what if we didn't believe that thought? Because it's just a thought, right? What if we didn't believe that thought? When we start meditating, what you see is you start observing your thoughts, and you can see they're coming and going, but they're always changing, and whether you want to believe in it or not is up to you. You don't have to. You know the thought. The thought doesn't know you. So meditation shows you that you're the sentient being. You're the awareness that knows the thought. And my point about happiness is what you see is once you start to really sit and look in, you will see that there's nothing missing. It's only when a thought comes by that tells you you're inadequate or you're you're unloved or you're not worthy, right? Or an emotion that lives in the body, because an emotion is really just the language of the unconscious mind. And thoughts are the language of, of the brain or the mind. And when you notice that these emotions or these thoughts are not you, there's just something you are observing, but they don't know you. And you tune in to that silence or that awareness that you are, you'll see that there's nothing missing and that it's a blissful state. And this is why people are meditating across all aspects of our society now. It's in professional sports, it's in uh, schools, it's in healthcare systems, it's in businesses. You know, in 2016, I think 20% of companies brought it in. In 2017, they expected 40%. You know, that's why you see people eventually really sitting in meditation for a long time because they're experiencing themselves free of all this chatter, right? And they're experiencing themselves, what they see is the nature of our true selves is bliss. And that's really important because when you understand that, <laughs> when you tune into that and you understand that the thoughts and the emotions and these belief systems aren't you, then what you realize you're not limited by them anymore and your body doesn't get triggered because the body only gets triggered, set into a stress response with a lot of chatter, a lot of mental, emotional problems that come up, 
and we have the ability to change them. Meditation allows us to change them. It strengthens the part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex, which is right here. And that part, it's our executive command center. It allows us to plan and make better choices. It allows us to control the impulses and the emotions. And so when you meditate, it's strengthening this part of the brain, which is also associated with your willpower. If you're not managing your stress, you're not managing your life. You're not managing your health. If you know that you have stress in your life, the question that you need to ask yourself is what are you gonna do about it, okay? Are you going to continue on that path or are you going to make an assessment? What I like to say is, you know, age is a number, right? Um, but growing older is episodic. So in this particular episode that you have right now in your life, do you really need to have all of those other elements that are adding stress? Or in this episode, you're clear that this is what you need to be focused on? If that's true, then you need to get rid of the other stuff. You need to decide. It's up to you to control your life, your health, and your happiness. The stress response often gets rolling when we have stressful thoughts. And I always, I train my clients, watch for the what ifs. When we start what ifing, the stinking thinking comes in, we start stressing. And, and if we end in a disastrous thought, it's called a catastrophic thought. What if I um, never see my grandchildren again? Or what if I never accomplish such and such? So these what ifs. And then when that happens, the body tenses up with this, especially if it's a catastrophic thought, and it's like a saber-toothed tiger just entered the room. And so we go into the fight, flight, or freeze responses, just naturally, the primitive part of the brain, and the body tenses up. And, and so the muscles are all just like screaming danger. So what I teach my clients is through hypnotherapy, through meditation, through guided imagery, how to engage, how to counter the stress response and get into that beautiful relaxation response. So when they start to meditate, they can quiet the mind down, quiet those thoughts down, let the adrenaline and the cortisol also quiet down, and then the body responds by relaxing. Stress is huge for elders. Again, stress releases the stress hormone cortisol. When you release that stress hormone cortisol, you're invariably also gonna be releasing insulin looking at, let's just talk about hormones for a second. You release cortisol, stress hormone, up comes insulin, and then down goes your growth hormone. Your growth hormone is your fountain of youth. It's what makes you stay young. It's what helps you build muscle. And so it's really, really important that stress stays low for a variety of reasons, just for the enjoyment of life. But once that stress hormone starts going up, premature aging starts going up as well. So it's something that's really important. Activity helps decrease cortisol. Social connection helps to decrease cortisol and raise serotonin. So these are simple things that people can do in their life. Have social connection. Eat foods that make you happy, like the clean lean protein that contains all the amino acids to help you produce neurotransmitters that make you happy and able to think the fibers that help keep your blood sugar balanced, and the healthy fats that also feed your brain chemistry. Keeping all that in balance with social connection, adequate exercise, adequate sleep, and you're looking at a recipe for someone that can really make a difference. Stress? Hmm. How did I get stressful? Oh, well, I was stressful most of my life anyway. <laughs> I just got over it. <laughs> Stress is part of being alive. It's part of being uh, associating with people you may not like. And you have to learn to like them or like yourself better. And it's a matter of growth. You have to keep growing and changing with your times and yourself. And it's, it's a 24-hour job. I think the first thing you have to learn, and it isn't easy, but you have to learn to like yourself. And then when you like yourself, you can go give love out to other people and you are concerned about other people and that makes your life happy. You're not bored ever. Life is really good. Family, great place to live. Really involved in a lot of things. And that I think is really important. 
Well, I think life is there for me to enjoy, to find all the things that I can do, and then look a little further. And I think also, for me, little acts of kindness are vital to my life. You just, you're standing in line, and if somebody has a great color for them, I think, tell them that this is wonderful. And I do the same thing with men. I say, God, that tie you're wearing is really incredible. And I, I just think you see the glow in their faces when you've done that. And it's taken nothing away from me, but added joy that I've made somebody happier. Since I've written this book, uh, my life has changed a lot because I never thought of myself as an author, but I am a poet at heart. And so uh, I keep very active. I play bridge three times a week, and I do the exercise. We go to parties. Um, this has made me a little famous. And I'm continuing to write. I may write another book next year or this year. and. Um, I just found my voice when I was about uh, in my 60s when I started the university program. Um, I'm a nutritionist, and as a nutritionist, I did a number of things, but I worked on a lot of rather interesting products, <laughs> projects, I should say. Uh, the most interesting was a very minor part of the Apollo program. I did the Voyager flight. Uh, I did three Mount Everest expeditions. I didn't, I'm not a climber, but for example, with the Mount Everest expeditions, what is the food they bring? What can they do to keep their health? Most Mount Everest climbers lose a lot of weight. The idea is how can you keep the weight on because they got to carry food up the mountain, things like that. The Voyager flight was a very interesting one because these, Pilots had to go aloft for roughly 14 days and they could carry a very limited amount of food with them and uh, we had to make sure they landed healthy and safely. Um, and then I worked, uh, believe it or not, the best project I ever worked on was for the Walt Disney World back east. They had me as a, on the board of directors of their land and food pavilion. And when you can introduce your kids to Donald Duck and Mickey Mouse, you're a hero at home. I don't care what you do for a living. As long as I'm able to hear and talk to people, people are very important. I love talking to uh, young people and try to keep myself abreast of what's going on in the world. The key to a happy life is growing, continually growing and seeing new things and what you can accomplish. That's exciting. And I look at that as a senior. One thing that I'm in very interested in is volunteering. I do work with giving out vouchers to the working poor and also to the homeless. And I can relate to their stories and I learn their stories. It's very important in a healthy life, not only to receive, but to give and to be there for others. Uh, we need support systems. If you've lost family, then you build friends. So I am enjoying life at this time very much. I've been living alone since 2007. I have a companion, which you'll meet later. Uh, my wife was a remarkable achiever. She was a craftsman and did and also a sculpture and very, very smart. And I attribute the success of both of my children to her well-being, to her caring. She was a caring mother and uh, proof of it was the success of both of my children. And I thank her. Uh, met Ben and uh, I was president of the formal dance club here in Rossmore, and it was called the Penguin, and he and his wife joined it. And I danced with him, and she danced with my husband, and we knew each other quite well for a thing for one year. And then he didn't renew his membership. 
but I found out that his wife was not feeling very well. So I didn't see them for about three years. And I went to an Italian dance here with a date. And he walked up to me and he said, hi, do you remember me? And I said, of course I remember you. <laughs> and so he asked me to go out and he sat next to the date and the date asked him about six, he said 100 questions. <laughs> yeah, I go shopping once a week at Diablo Foods in Lafayette and all of the people who work there are so interested in what I am doing. So this one day, this young man was, was training a kid, looked like he was maybe 18 or 19. And uh, he turned to the kid and he said, you want to ask Mary Louise any questions? So he said, yeah, I want to ask her what keeps her so young and interested in everybody. And, and uh, I said, well, you, you got to have a lot of sex. That'll keep you young. When we look out into the world, we don't really know what we look like, but we do know that we're that same young child that we were when we were growing up. That never changes. So although your body may be changing, your needs to be around people, your needs to be loved, to have interaction is essential for a happy and fulfilled life. Um, and if you're not getting that, then chances are you're affecting yourself deeply psychologically because we are social creatures. And if you're not getting the social connection, then you're setting yourself up for disaster. We need to be challenged and entertained, otherwise we get bored. And when we get bored, what do we do? Looking for that challenge and entertainment, we tend to gravitate towards our vices. It's so important to stay active, to be positive, to um, stay involved with other people. Social interaction, I think, is really important. I think it's important to just continue learning um, in whatever way one can. Uh, if a person can't really read that well, there's books on audio. There's all kinds of things to keep the brain involved and active. Find something in your life that you really want to do and do it. Uh, if it's more than one thing, do more than one thing. But there has to be some purpose for your life to be here on Earth. And if you don't have any and you're just kind of wandering around willy-nilly, uh, it's not a very satisfying place to be. Uh, service is a wonderful thing. If you can do something that's of service to others, that's great too. But your main purpose in life is to develop yourself. Lifelong learning is very important for a senior. And I have a goal, every year I do something that I've never done before. And it's a feeling of accomplishment, whether it's zip lining as this year, <laughs> or if it's learning something new. Hey, one of my childhood dreams, of course, being interested always in astronomy and asking the question is, their life out there besides us. All my life I've always had a telescope. I used to build my own, grind my own lenses and everything. And as I got older and a little bit prosperous, I built my own observatory and bought a very, very beautiful telescope. And it was the fulfillment of a childhood dream. I got to take pictures and images of planets and the moon and things like that that I had only dreamed of when I was a kid. Well, I did it, and that's the important thing. And the same with a lot of other people can do exactly the same thing. I've sold all the rocking chairs in my house. I don't intend to use any of them, and I keep moving. As long as I have the strength and will to move, I keep doing things. I'm still working at 104. I do arbitration for FINRA, and I've got some cases now that are very challenging, 
<clears throat> and I think as long as my mind functions, I tend to function. I can give you a good example. My mom, she's 80 years old, and she practices yoga, she lifts weights, she walks around the track, walks about four miles a day, and she and I'm able to also talk with not just people like her, but also uh, I work with doctors and, and patients. And what we see with, with my mom and patients that I work with, that when they are active, when they're eating better, when they're drinking water, that they're less likely to have any diseases. My mom just came off blood pressure meds and off of cholesterol meds, and she's, she's 80 years old. Being active is very important in my life. Uh, I would find it very difficult to be just restricted to a very small area. Uh, I think that happens to a lot of people as they get older. They narrow their lives and they pull in until it just gets smaller and smaller until it's practically a coffin. I'm glad I did a lot of things. A lot of people have a tendency to do one thing in their lives. I, as we said, I worked on a lot of different projects ranging all the way from working with Apollo astronauts to uh, people on the Olympic ski team. And I found that uh, there's nothing like variety in your life and the people you meet, the things you learn, you never stop learning. And when you stop learning, you've made a huge mistake. It doesn't have to stop when you get older. You can keep it up and you can find all kinds of new and interesting things. I started writing poetry when I was attending the university in Fullerton, California. It was called Continuing Learning Experience for people my age. I stayed there for 30 years and the idea was that that started with 40 people with an idea and uh, they contributed their time and energy to building that, what's called the Ruby Gerontology Building. It now has an attendance of about 1,600 people, and we started with 44. What I would like to give as a message, actually, is to do something with passion. I just simply had a passion for teaching. And teaching is really, if you boil it right down to it, teaching is just sharing. You go to school, you learn things that you're passionate about, and the passion to pass that on to students is, doesn't get any more exciting than that. I happen to have a hobby of astronomy, and that gets me in contact with just a tremendous number of people. In fact, I even got the opportunity to work with the people at UC Berkeley. Met some great people. Met a Nobel Prize winner, in fact. Well, I work for the FBI, and it can be boring like any job. So one day it was Thanksgiving, and I go to work, and I say, oh, Lord, please make this an exciting day. And I got off the elevator, and one of the agents said to me, have you heard there's a skyjacking? I just, oh, my God, Lord, I didn't mean that exciting. So we did. We handled the skyjacking. The agents had to take money out to um, D.B. Cooper. And when they took the money out, they had to go in the boxer shorts because no weapons were to be shown. So D.B. Cooper did get away. He jumped out of the airplane with 200,000 cash. They have rumors now he has been found, and they're all rumors. He's still there. He's still out there. Well, the most exciting daredevil experience I had by far was parachuting out of the airplane at 12,000 feet. Well, I did a lot of different things. I, again, uh, started out as the chairman of the Unilever Nutrition Committee. The Unilever at the time was the world's largest food company. And I was the chairman of their nutrition committee. 
And in the process, that was where we did, in case the astronauts got stuck on the, on the moon or in the lunar capsule and were unable to get their spacesuit off. You know, it's not like in the movies where they lift up their visor and eat a sandwich. You can't do that. So we had to have something inside their helmet that they could eat. That, that was my part in the whole thing. They never needed it. Everything worked fine. But that's the way it is. And I taught at medical school. I was a professorial lecturer at Georgetown Medical School for like 20 years. And the students would get me three times a week, once in their whole medical education, uh, where I introduced them to nutrition. I would teach them the basis of inflammation. And then um, I, in fact, inflammation being important, I wrote three books on in, that relate to inflammation, uh, two on rheumatoid arthritis and one on Crohn's disease for the layman to help people live. In fact, my book for people with Crohn's disease, the Hofstra University in New York awarded me the honored doctor of humane letters, which proves I'm, in addition to being a biochemist by my doctoral degree, I'm a humane person and I've got a great big degree to prove it. And, <laughs> and that was one of the neat outcomes. And then in the other, aspects of my life rather than strictly work for someone else. I did work a lot on my own. As I said, I wrote, I did a lot of public speaking in different parts of the world. It was a lot of work, but it was great. For example, how many people get invited to speak at the Club Med in Rio de Janeiro? Okay, you have to talk about nutrition, you have to listen to motivational speakers, but by golly, we also got to spend a week in Rio. I entered the convent before I graduated from high school. So I was teaching at 19, and I've taught every grade from first to eighth at that time. I was in the convent for 31 years, and uh, I, it gave me a lot of confidence in training and teaching and understanding children. I have benefited a great deal from that. But then I continued teaching. I was a principal in the convent and I was a principal after uh, I left the convent. Uh, I also taught adult education. Uh, I attended Harvard University and uh, learned the theories of Lawrence Kohlberg for developmental moral education uh, and wrote a book and did workshops across the country. In, uh, in order to help teachers to see how children morally grow and make decisions. We did a lot of moral dilemmas in those days. Yeah, I think probably overcoming the injuries probably has helped me as much as anything. It seems strange that a series of injuries and near-death experiences would improve your life, but for me, it that's that's exactly what it is. You know, you, I've always appreciated life. I always lived it as excitingly as I can, but then to keep getting reprieved, so to speak, and carrying on and being able to do that, I, I really appreciate it. I don't know if there's a supernatural or not, but it seems almost as though someone has been looking after me. Well, I've worked my whole life. I worked all through high school. I had two jobs going to college. And one day in college, I said to myself, what are you doing here? And I couldn't come up with a good answer. So I quit college, went downtown and got a job. I wrote a script and sent it to the local radio station and they bought it. So I started doing a show that I wrote myself. And then I got a job managing a record shop, never having bought one. And I did a disc jockey show. And then I thought, I think I'll make this my career. And I went to broadcasting school in Minneapolis and met my husband there. And after four dates, we were married and we worked together in radio and television. The main thing that I can think of doing is don't let yourself fall into a rut. Get out and do things. And if, if nothing else, socialize. 
call up a couple of friends and say, hey, what do you say we get together for dinner one night next week? Or what do you say we get together and go down and watch a movie? Or go and look at the parade or something like that. The idea is to, to get out, interact with people, and enjoy what they do as well as you. And then if you've ever thought of something, let's say you were a kid and you liked to paint, well, gosh darn it, get out and there's usually a classes for seniors, take an art class. You may feel like a jerk with, with what you come up with, but on the other hand, you've done it. You've tried something new. One thing I realized as I got older is that you really have to have something like this that occupies your time and your mind. Otherwise, what are you gonna do? Sit around and read books and watch TV? This airplane is really the, the you know, aside from my wife, of course, is my main concern. <laughs> and uh, I think it's important to have something like that. It's never too late to get healthy. My mother's 80 years old, and last year I got her off blood pressure meds and off of cholesterol meds. And it's because she made a conscientious effort to look at what she's putting in her body every day. There's so much data and content that's available to us right now. It really gets confusing. There's so many diet books out there and so many perspectives. And at the end of the day, you just need to cut through the confusion and cut through the chaos. And keep it smart and keep it clean. Stay away from the packaged, processed foods. Stick with clean, filtered water. Stick with your leafy greens, your root veggies, your starchy veggies, colorful vegetables on your plate, clean, lean protein, healthy fats, and lots of fiber. And with all of that, you're gonna be also keeping your blood sugar much more stable. That's really important. And stay connected to friends and to people. And get outside and smell the fresh air and see the blue sky and hear the birds and enjoy your life. It doesn't matter if you're 20 or if you're 80 like my mom or even older and you've got diseases, it's not too late to really take a hard look at your diet, your exercise, and your, your water intake. My advice to keep breathing and living as you grow older is to be happy and not dwell on the past. To have something that you like to do and meet other people all the time, socialize. And um, you can find a boyfriend if you've lost your husband. There's new ways of connecting nowadays than there ever has been. So. No reason not to live to be 120. I am living my life every day. I don't want to miss anything. I want people to look around at the world and get involved in it, and get involved with other people, and children, my God, spend time with them, read to them, take them places, show them all the things out there in the world. It's their world now. Really get involved, contribute, do something useful.